Welcome to the REI Rookies Podcast, the real estate investing rookies podcast, episode number 10, where we invite you to follow us on our journey towards financial freedom using the power of real estate. I'm Josh Koth. And I'm Jack Haas. And here at REI Rookies, we believe in a couple key principles. Number one, the best way to retain information is by teaching it to others. And number two, a rising tide lifts all boats. We're not competitors, we're a community. So let's get into some real estate investing. So this week we're revisiting the topic of m- the mind shift or taking the red pill when it comes to real estate. So when you say mindset shift or taking the red pill, just to let people know, where does that term taking the red pill come from? Well, if you're a geek like me, it comes from the Matrix movies <laughs> where Neo is given a choice. Um, uh, taking, is it a blue pill? I think it's a blue pill and a, and a red pill. And the blue pill basically says you're going to just continue on in the matrix, being a worker bee, just living your life thinking everything's great. Being the battery. Yep. <laughs> yeah. A fuel source. Otherwise, you can take the red pill and f- the truth is revealed and you can, you know, be in control of your own destiny, right? Yep. And and uh, so, Josh, I'm sure that there's a lot of people who are going to ask why we're revisiting this topic again. Yeah, and our first two episodes where we told your story and my story about how we got into real estate investing and just wealth building and passive income generation in general, uh, I consider those to be mindset episodes because that's really what we were doing was we had a mindset shift and that's what led us to real estate investing. So I think it's so crucial to constantly revisit the reasons why you're down down this path because it's going to be hard there's going to be setbacks there's all kinds of uh you know negative things associated with it times will get tough so when you have to constantly you know remind yourself why you're doing it and kind of you know refill up the tank uh so you have enough enough uh grit you know as as we mentioned a couple episodes ago grit is so important so you have enough to power through those tough times so i think it's it's a great way to refuel and you know we have a situation where you you are the sum of the five people that you hang out with the most. And I think when it comes to pod, I don't know about you, but I almost consider a lot of the podcasts and audiobooks that I listen to as is another person. Mm-hmm. Um, so to pr- push more of that information into my feeble little brain, as Josh refers to it, when <laughs> at the beginning of some of our podcasts. Um, it's important to hear these lessons over and over again, just as a reminder and a refocus. Yeah, I mean, I think repetition is so key. Um, <clears throat> and it just keeps your motivation up. You know, I listen to a lot of personal growth type information, a lot of real estate, and a lot of just investing podcasts in general. And uh, it all just contributes in, to maintaining that mindset. mindset. Because once you've shifted and you've kind of taken the red pill and realized you know what the possibilities are then you need to maintain that and constantly feed that and refuel so when we talk about taking the red pill and a a mindset shift we're basically saying you know what what's your long-term goal right so most people who are blue pill as we call it you're in the matrix and just uh you know on the rat race that's the typical you know work get a good job go to college get a good job work till you're you know save some money and work till you're 65 and hopefully you can retire with a modest income and you know that's that's really all you can hope for right that's that would be the the normal blue pill way of thinking so we have taken the red pill and and our goal is to retire earlier um, have passive income exceed your your expenses and exceed your income goals even and continue to grow that and to also leave wealth for the next generation so that's kind of how we have chosen to pursue um, wealth building and that's what we call being red pilled so just you know what whatever method you use to generate passive income or wealth we've chosen real estate but you know a lot of those people are on the same path and have, you know, there's plenty of ways to generate passive income. We've just found real estate to be the most productive of those. Yeah, and you, you call it a rat race. I almost call it a rat trap. Um, a lot of the people that are working and focusing on saving their way to um, to retirement are, are really going to struggle in doing so. We have to remind ourselves that 
I, I'm not going to speak for everybody, but in my situation, if if I want to retire at 65, I'm going to have to save 1.3 to one one and a half million dollars to live off of a fifty thousand dollar a year income for me and my wife. And yep. that is that is a daunting mountain to climb in mm -hmm. saving that type of money. I, taking the red pill, would much rather uh, save or purchase enough real estate in order to provide the streams of income that give me a steady $5,000 a month or more than trying to save one and a half million dollars. Yep, and because, and just to run some numbers here, if you're generating five grand a month in passive income, that's basically the same as generating $60,000 a year if, if you were working a job, correct? Right, and and it's it's much easier and when you put it into that time in, into that picture into that frame and it it's such a much it's much more manageable amount to deal with mm -hmm. when you're talking about five or even ten thousand dollars a month that i have to figure out and and earn in a passive way compared to uh trying to squirrel away all of that money millions of dollars in the end yeah, exactly. And you'll notice that even when you have the, the big pile of money that you're working, for one thing, that means you're working till 65. And most people won't even get close to that amount. If you ever if you ever want to have a really depressing half hour or so, find one of those, you know, retirement calculators on the web and enter in your the balance you have in your savings now and what your salary is. And it'll tell you how much you need to put away every month in order to get there. And most people don't have a shot at all of generating that huge pile of money because, you know, we've talked about this before, but the average balance in a 401k when someone reaches 65 years old is what, like 90 grand? Yeah. And we, we have a, it, it's just back to that premise again. That earning those streams of income is a much easier thing to grasp and, and accomplish mm -hmm. than, than trying to save all that money. And when we get to the age of 65 years old, I am shuddering in the thought of how many of our peers are likely going to have to continue working. Right. And that's, yeah, that's really the key. And here's another, you know, when you've been red-pilled, here's another uh, revelation that happens. Okay, you start to say, well, rather than, you know, generate or save up 1.3 million in order to spin off 50 grand a year i want to generate five grand a month in passive income rather than you know which equals about 60 grand a year that's so roughly equivalent um so basically then you you realize that well as soon as i hit that five grand a month technically i could retire because if that's what i'm living on now or what i need to survive technically then you're financially free and that's really the goal uh, for you know, for us, anyways, and for most people that are trying to wealth build and generate passive income. So really, you just have to decide. Okay, what are my expenses per month? What it was it take to run my family to live to survive? And then, uh, as soon as you hit that in passive income, that amount, you know, and I think my number is right around there. You know, five grand is just. I mean, we're not talking vacations and stuff here. We're just talking bare bones expenses. You know just to keep things moving along. <clears throat> and I, I would say we're very average in the upper Midwest. That's pretty typical. Most most families could probably survive on that amount of money if they had to. And, you know, you can adjust that, obviously, to your taste. And our goal is to exceed that, obviously. But the important point is once you've hit that number, then you have the freedom to, you know, work more or less um, and spend your time in a more personal way, in a, a way that's more satisfying to you personally. So that's really the key. I mean, you're not on that rat race, the treadmill, the worker be, you know, until 65 plus. And <clears throat> when I ran the numbers on my retirement calculator, you know, I was going to have to work way past 65. And my financial advisor at the time was saying things like, well, you know, you could reduce your lifestyle some, you could work a little bit longer. And you can tell this, they say this every day to people. You know, you and that and that's not something I was willing to do. I want to meet or exceed what I'm earning now 
when I'm in retirement. I want to actually be able to enjoy myself. And I also do not want to work longer than I have to. I mean, who would, right? Or if I decide to, it's because it's doing something I want to do rather than having to do it, which is a big point. Yeah, that that's really important. I, I'm very much in the same ballpark as you on that, Josh. I When I get to the be- benefit of being able to retire, uh, the last thing I want to do is cut back on how I'm living. Right. Um, to, to be living off something a lot less and mm-hmm. getting by in retirement does not sound like the golden age of retirement that I hope for. Exactly. And the nice thing about when you generate passive income, especially using real estate, then, you know, you have um, wealth to pass on to your heirs because those are assets, right? So not only are they would they be inheriting the passive income streams generated by those assets, they would also inherit the actual assets themselves. Um, so that's that's really a massive another massive reason and very important reason for me why I've chosen this route. And I'd have to echo that. And so in the end, to just kind of summarize this this concept is that are you are you willing to save? and sacrifice today to live off the meager savings of tomorrow? Are you willing to make those sacrifices now, create a portfolio, and retire comfortably and hopefully earlier? Right, exactly. And if anything, um, even if you just do a minor amount of investing, you know, post-retirement, and see, you know, you can actually live way better and continue to grow your portfolio and your passive income. I mean, my goal would be probably never to be just completely done and out of real estate, right? Even if you, if I hit that goal of five grand a month or ten grand a month, or even exceed it by three or three or four times, just with very little effort, you know, through the snowballing type of effect, you know, having assets pay for the purchase of other assets, those types of things. It's very easy to just continue that growth. Um, let's say you're generating 10 grand a month. You get to the point where you're generating 10 grand a month in passive income. Well, it'd be pretty easy to set aside three grand of that a month, you know, and then you have 30, another 36,000 a year. You could use that to buy another asset or, you know, one year or every two years, you could buy another one. So you could easily add to your portfolio with very little effort. Yeah. I think I've heard other podcasters refer to it as, uh, that real estate snowball effect mm-hmm. exactly. where you're starting to use the your current real estate to acquire the next. Yep, exactly. So, I mean, it just, uh, it's, you know, it's compounding, the traditional type of compounding that you hear about in your IRA, except for it's with tangible assets. So, as long as you're getting those, hitting those ROI numbers that you need to hit, then you can really take advantage of that and accelerate that process. So, you know, basically it goes, it comes down to, do you want to, save your way to retirement or do you want to generate passive income streams through income producing assets you know that's that's really the fork in the road that's the decision to be made so we've we've taken the red pill and and we're trying to generate income streams and grow that passive income amount so that's that's the road we're on and that's everything else that we do on the podcast and with the real estate investing is all geared towards that effort. That's why in our exit strategy series, where we went through all the different exit strategies, buy and hold is the one where we say every dollar should ultimately end up because that's what produces these streams of income, these passive income streams is the buy and hold real estate. So that's, you know, really the the holy grail. That's what we're we're, where we're trying to end up with every dollar eventually ending up there. So with that, I think we need to, to like look at some of the traditional savings that are offered to us through the blue pill. Things that we, I'm not going to say are, are terrible investments by any stretch, but I think people need to start to question whether it is the best use of the of those monies and and those savings. A good example is a traditional savings account. Yeah. If it's just, uh, yeah. I just shuddered on that one. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> you know, there's there's still a lot of the population that is squirreling money money under their mattress or mm-hmm. they're putting it in a, a savings account, and it's 
literally getting a fraction of a percentage on a return or or a CD, mm -hmm. um, something that's going to be very low yielding but safe. Mm -hmm. um, I would even question how safe some of those things are because when I was looking at some of the savings before real estate that I, I was involved in, a lot of it, any kind of potential return that I was getting was typically eaten alive by the fees, inflation, the low returns. Mm -hmm. um, when we had that significant downturn in the market not too long ago, frankly, mine never recovered. Uh, yeah, and that's one thing that people need to understand. For every dollar you're putting into a, a low-yield investment, it's actually losing its buying power because that same dollar, you know, five, ten years down the road, uh, if if the interest rate you're getting is not at least matching inflation, the inflation rate, then you can actually buy less with that dollar. You know, even if it grows to two dollars, let's say it doubles. Well, if you know, if if a ga gallon of milk costs more than double uh, during the same time period, then that dollar actually loses buying power. So you you want to put your money somewhere where it's generating a high enough return. So that you're exceeding the rate of inflation. So you're actually, your buying power is increasing. And, you know, people think, well, I put a thousand dollars in the bank and it's, it's only getting a quarter percent or one percent or something. But if inflation is ticking along at four or five percent or six percent, well, that that dollar is losing its buying power with every passing month and year. So that's not where you want what you want your money to be doing. You want it to be earning above the rate of inflation or you're going to be losing buying power. Yeah, and then depending on the part of the country you're in, that can impact you even more. You know, in Fargo, we're going to be pretty stable in mm -hmm. regards to the living expenses and the cost of living mm -hmm. and inflation. However, you know, on the on the coast, you're probably going to see it spike even more. And that that lo low yielding CD does becomes even less and less attractive. Yep, exactly. <clears throat> you know, so that's. I mean, I don't know many uh, investors that would consider, you know, a bank account or a CD a good investment. And I think most of the population is aware of that. But here's where we get really nasty, right? Here's where we get some some nasty mail. Uh, you know, you say 401k or Roth IRA. Uh, well, that's a good investment, right? And that's actually what I was referring to regarding it never being never bouncing back. Uh, for me, it was a Roth IRA. Uh, had I, to me, quite a bit of money in there. Mm -hmm. uh, never bounced back from that downturn, and every penny that that uh, account was going to is generating was uh, being eaten by fees and everything else associated with managing that IRA. Um, and here's one thing, you know, and not to insult financial planners out there, but I question. No matter how skilled they are, their ability to actively manage your funds, you know, what are they really doing every quarter, or every year to, uh, you know, reallocate or make choices for you? I mean, what are they doing besides collecting fees? You know, how are they how are they ensuring that you're getting the highest return possible? I question their ability to do that, even if they have the best of intentions, Uh because, you know, just the unpredictability of the stock market and those investments that are held within mutual funds, stocks, traditional investments inside those IRAs and 401ks. Um, and, you know, how much say do they even have in what's going on in those companies? Obviously, no say, but how good is their, you know, average of choosing those? Is it any better than you just doing it yourself or just throwing a dart at a dartboard? I question, I question whether they're really producing you a higher rate of return than, than, you know, if you just put it in a savings account. You know, we're always going to say there's a caveat to that. You know, Josh and I personally know quite a few financial planners that are likely very good at what they do. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, it could be this part of the country as well. You know, we, we're very intentive folk up here. <laughs> <laughs> right. But, but I just think that even the most talented one is going to have a hard time, you know, beating the market. I think there's just so much luck involved. And basically, at, at best, they're going to help you just retain your principal and, you know, possibly get some lower yields. 
but it's going to be really tough for them to beat, uh, you know, any other type of uh, more active investment like real estate when done correctly. You know, it's going to be tough for them to exceed that that return. I would say. Yeah. So we're going to go into the second most uh, scary topic when it comes to investment, and we're going to actually say that your house shouldn't be considered an investment. And this could be something that... Jack, how dare you say that? <laughs> well, and it could it could depend on the, the market again. You know, in Fargo right now, we have a very good situation that Josh brought up uh, earlier uh, that he and I were chatting about. In Fargo, we're kind of in a unique situation in the fact that it kind of makes a bit more sense to buy, if we're honest, than to rent right now. Mm -hmm. And this um, is kind of a hot topic amongst real estate podcasts, right? They kind of like like to drop the bomb on people and say your house is a is a horrible investment, and that may be true in some markets. It, it might be true in Fargo with the wrong house as well. Um, but basically, how you would decide that is you would say, well, what does it cost to rent versus you know your average house versus what does it cost to buy it? Well, here in Fargo, the rent rental market is kind of high, so and houses are still reasonably you know inexpensive. So as an example, I had a house that I just recently sold for $107,000 to a person. And, and that house was rented out for $950 a month. Well, we did some calculations and their, their mortgage payment on the house is going to be $623. So in that situation, in that neighborhood... It makes sense to purchase versus rent because, you know, well, yes, the equity in your house is not uh, necessarily keeping pace with inflation just because the rate of appreciation is typically slightly lower than than uh, inflation. Um, they're still better off than if they would have been renting because then you're retaining no equity. You're not building any equity at all. And even with your your mortgage payment being $623, that's principal interest, taxes and insurance, you still have enough room. Uh, you know, there's a $327 difference there between what I was renting it for. So even if you put that aside for maintenance and all the other things that you're responsible for as the homeowner versus being a renter, you still come out ahead. So I think in Fargo, you know, we have a unique situation there. Other areas of the country, not so much. So, But just understand also that every dollar of equity that's sitting in your house, maybe an okay savings account, but don't look at it as an investment. At best, your re your dollar for dollar is, is barely keeping pace, pace with inflation over time. So, you know, if you end up paying off your house early and you have a couple hundred thousand dollars sitting there in equity, well, number one, that's hard to extract, right? It's sitting there. You can't really use it for anything unless you're going to borrow against it or do a cash out refi and extract that equity, which if you're going to use that to purchase an income producing asset, that, that might be a great idea. But if it's just sitting there in equity, the only way you extract is if you sell. Well, then where are you going to live? You still, you know, you still have an, uh, an ex a lodging expense every month, right? So just understand that the money sitting in equity in your personal residence is not necessarily a great investment. And I bet if you asked most people, what's, you know, your biggest investment, what's the, you know, your biggest asset, they would say my house, right? And any equity contained within it. And I think we've kind of made it clear here why that may be an okay savings account, but it's not a great investment. Especially when you take into account that appreciation. Josh and I do not buy properties on that speculative appreciation and, and I'm going to call it a myth when it comes to real estate because it, it's not what's generating our monthly cash, cash flow. No. Um, so when we say that your house is appreciating as, as quickly as, on average, as quickly as inflation, it pretty much wipes it out. I mean, that money is just, it's, it's sitting there. Um, and uh, you're basically sitting in a pile of cash. Yep. Um, and that's going to be great. You know, and when, when you're older, I'm not going to say I'm, I'm, I'm doing that, uh, extra payment a year myself on my mortgage payment, trying to reduce the length of time I'm paying on that house. Cause when I retire, frankly, I don't want that payment, mm -hmm. but that's more of a security thing than 
anything else. Yeah, it's, and everybody has to invest and do what's right for them and their risk tolerance. Let me ask you this, though. If you were to take that same extra money you're paying on your house and funnel it into an investment that's actually producing a higher ROI, would that be a smarter method? It would be if there was enough money there. The problem I have is that your next bullet item leads right into this, <laughs> that budgeting is another failing diet. And I can especially say that is for me. If I'm going to try to set aside that type of, you know, it, it, in my case, it's like an extra uh, $60 a month mm -hmm. uh, or whatever it is to make that extra payment. To set aside that money for that type of purpose, it's going to take a long time for me to get any, any, anywhere in order to purchase that next property. Um, and you might just blow it on something else along the way. Right. The new Xbox or something might come out. Yep, you so. know, it's, it's, it, and the kids want it. You yep, know, I all. understand. So that's, you know, something where you have to, you know, invest for, with your own risk tolerance in mind. Um, but I, I'll tell you what, though, I've definitely changed. You know, when I bought my last house, I mean, well, two houses ago for my own personal residence before I had taken the red pill, my goal was get a 15 year mortgage, get it paid off as soon as I could. And I want to own that house free and clear, be sitting on sitting on it, you know, the big pot, the big asset, right? The big savings account. That's kind of how I looked at it. But you now know, I'm stretch, trying to stretch stretch that out and have my payment be as low as possible and use extra income to, uh, you know, buy income-producing assets. So I've definitely been red-pilled in that regard. Yeah, one of the things that has worked for me is uh, – and I think you you can speak to this a little too, Josh. Is pulling the equity out of out of my house? You know, with with I did the refinancing, got the mortgage, and then I I got a HELOC uh, for the remaining equity in my property. And I had a situation where I had to get a new roof on my house. Mm -hmm. It had to have new shingles and new gutters, and and it was frankly expensive. And I had to get it done. Uh, so when you take the red pill, you kind of come at it at a different angle. So I took a HELOC out and large enough that I could put the roof, take care of the roof and buy a rental property, mm -hmm. which now is paying f off my HELOC and my roof. And then some, right? And then some. <clears throat> yeah, that's a, that's a great strategy. You know, that's one thing that I've read in a lot of is a common thread amongst very rich and wealthy people. And they, rather than, you know, just purchasing items, they think, well, what, what asset can I buy instead that will produce enough income to own that item? You know, so that's, just, it's just a another mindset shift. It's just a change in your thinking. You know, I heard a story one, one time where a gentleman was talking about, he wanted a certain sports car or something, a pure luxury item. And he was telling his wife about it. And the wife said, mm, not, a, not a fan. And he said, well, I'll just purchase an asset and that'll, that'll pay for the sports car. So, you know, th that's kind of how, how you change your thinking when it comes to that. So I think that's very smart uh, on, on your part. And you're not letting that equity in your house just sit there idling, you know, barely keeping pace with inflation. You're, pulling it out and using it to buy an income producing asset and then pay back that that HELOC. So it's that's a great strategy. In the end now I'll have a I have my new roof and another producing property. Right. So as soon as you pay down the balance on that HELOC, then you'll have that cash flow too. Because once the asset is paid for, that income still keeps coming in. That's the genius of streams of income and passive income versus a pile of cash. And trying to save up for that big pile, so that's and it, and it might be a, a mental shift, like you said, you know, regarding the budget. You know, I I find it for some reason, I have my rental properties in another a different bank account. Mm -hmm. um, it, the money is set aside. It's it's money that I'm not personally living off of. Right. I don't have it flowing through my everyday life at, at this point. And I'm mm -hmm. deliberately leaving it that way. Um, so to refunnel those funds to a different purpose right now is far easier for me to deal with than trying to carve out a fraction of our current income for another purpose. Yep, exactly. And once that grows, it just gets easier and easier. You know, like, like we said, once you grow up to 10 grand a month in personal or in passive income, it's pretty easy to set aside a couple grand a month towards, you know, growing that portfolio. 
you know, it, it just gets easier and easier the, once you s speak about do larger dollar amounts. So that kind of wraps up our content for this week. And uh, you'll probably hear a lot more episodes about mindset shift and taking the red pill because we feel it's so important to constantly recharge your batteries and jack and i both listen to a lot of podcasts and read books and a lot of mindset related material because it's so crucial to have that in your holster you know in your tool belt when you're need to push through the tough times that you will encounter in real estate investing so um, look for a mindset episode every few episodes probably so with that, we'll jump into the lesson of the week, and it's going to be real estate investing specific. And I'm going to push you towards taking a look at if this, then that, I-F-T-T-T. -T -T. Is, is that a dot .com or what is that? Uh, I think it might. Yeah, it is a dot .com. Um, if, if you do a search for I-F-T-T-T, -T -T, yeah, it's, it's going to be the first thing that comes up on the list. It's such a unique uh, solution. But there's a lot of other, there's commercial products that are also available for this. And I'm sure that there's a paid for version of, of this through that uh, uh, site as well. But well, the reason I like this and the reason we use it is because I also have uh, phone apps that mm. we can easily manage things on the go if, if we need to. Mm -hmm. But you can use If This Then That to set up triggers. And I currently have triggers for Craigslist. Um, so if a property hits Craigslist that falls within a certain price range, it automatically sends us uh, kind of a, a details from mm -hmm. that listing with a link to, to it directly. One of the new things that we're going to start using it for is finding seller financing uh, properties. In our last episode, we talked about seller financing as an exit strategy. Yep. Now I'm talking about possibly using it as a purchasing strategy. So do you just set up keywords and then it'll find, it'll send you all the results based on keywords? Well, you basically go to Craigslist and do your search. Mm -hmm. um, and then you copy and paste the created URL uh, from that search. Okay, so it has and, all the data required to generate right. that same search. Right. If you look at the results. URL in Craigslist, it's going to have all of the search criteria. Okay. Kind of embedded in that in that URL. Here's the other nice thing about this too. Jack was getting these emails, and I said, "Well, I'm the one kind of researching these properties. You need to put me on that list." So you can forward it to multiple emails, correct? Yep, you can have it multiple emails, and you can adjust the the settings. You know, so we found that we were getting a lot of uh, trailer houses, for example, in our search results. Mm -hmm. So we just raised the bottom end. So our search now is all properties listed that are 50,000 to 150,000, for yep, example. Exactly. And now we're, it kind of weeds out a lot of the um, mobile homes because that's just something that we don't really deal with. Yeah. And I can speak from personal experience here that this is really a great tool because typically before that, I, I would have to go through Craigslist and manually comb through everything. And that's a pain and it's tough to remember to do that and you have to set aside time. Now they're just popping up. These emails are just popping up. So you can just quick scan them and then, you know, either make a note or forward it to yourself and make a note to look at the property further or just disregard it. But either way, it's it's much more automated and happens much more quickly. So that, that's a great been a great tool. Yeah, so the, the one thing that we're going to be doing now is um, setting up a new search to find the seller financing properties. And this is one of the things that I've kind of had a revelation on recently. You're, we're trying to find not only uh, properties, but we're trying to find seller financed or um, we're trying to find private lending, right? What mm -hmm. better properties would there could there be than people who are already on Craigslist trying to do exactly that? Yep. Seller financing. Mm -hmm. So we're uh, going to start, start to explore that option. Yeah, it's just another line in the water. And we'll probably do a series upcoming. Uh, you know, since we did a series of exit strategies, we'll do a series of acquisition strategies as well. Since we have multiple lines in the water and multiple methods and strategies out there in the world. Um, that's just another one. And, you know, you want to be able to uh, find a good discounted property but with built-in equity from any source that you can so the, the more options you have for finding those the better so that's craigslist is it can be a great source so going on to coach's corner 
this is kind of something that's becoming uh, top of mind for me, and I think I might have mentioned it in a previous uh, cast, but here it goes. So Jack's about to get on, on a little rant here. Oh, boy. So I'm going to talk about the power power of choice. And I think a lot of people don't think about it to the level that it needs to be. We, now, is this a book, or is this just off off Jack's brain here. Well, I think it's a culmination of a lot of books. We can we can start by the you know, we we talked about the traveler's gift. Mm-hmm. They talk about it. Um we can even you know, today I I listened to a a speaker who the the what is it, the five second rule? Oh, yep. Um there's a lot of people talking about it, but I really wanted so it's just a culmination of that, and I think it finally like resonated, you know, like we're, we're, we're when we we're, we're we are ready when we're receptive, right? So um, here's here's the deal, as we all know, life is a series of choices, or at least I hope we all know that. But I want to say that life is not only a series of choices, but every finite choice is something that you have control of. We choose our friends, our job, our getting, whether we're even going to get out of bed, how we interact with others, how we respond to situations. We even choose whether we're going to be happy or content that day. See, you know, right there, that's powerful because so many people are reactive and, you know, just kind of have the victim mentality of life is happening to them. Like they have no choice in the matter and they're not, you know, in control of the outcome. And I think I 100% disagree with that. Um, I think people have way, way more influence over the outcome of their life than they believe that they do, including, like you said, to be happy or content. I mean, you talk about glass half full, glass half empty type of people, right? I mean, you could stick 10 people in the same exact job and there's one guy that's going to be complaining about this job is horrible, this job sucks. And another guy two rows down is going to be like, this is the best job I've ever had, I love it here. You know, you can can choose how you're going to approach it and whether you're going to be miserable or content or even satisfied and happy. I mean, I've had plenty of crappy jobs, what people would call crappy jobs along, you know, my illustrious uh, employment career. And you decide... Okay, am I going to make the best of this or am I going to be miserable? I mean, it is a choice. You know, unless you're literally doing a really horrible, you know, coal mining type of job or something with this really hard physical labor. But I would argue that even some of those guys, they're happy to have that job and they make the best of it. You know, they're deciding how they're going to approach it. Yeah, so I'm going to go as far as the saying if you are not happy or content right now, What choices are you going to make to change it? Oh, that's a big one. How many people do you know, let's say, every day they, you know, you run into them and they're complaining, I I hate this job, I hate this, you know, my weight, I hate some aspect of their life, right? And, you know, what, and that's exactly right, what are they doing to make changes? Uh, If it's nothing, then in my mind, it sort of revokes your right to complain about it, right? Right, and and I'm going to even go further in saying not n- now you've made a choice. What action are you going to take to change it? Exactly, and like weight loss is a big one, right? I mean, everybody always complains about weight, but you know exactly what are you doing to change that? I mean, there's no knowledge gap anymore. Everyone knows what to do to lose weight. You know, it's just eating the right things and eating less of it. You know, I'm not going to get into the whole diet thing here but um everyone knows what to do it's just a matter of executing that and sticking to it and that that's where the the gap is i think and that's really important i want to echo what josh just said is that you know what you need to do you do we have a ton of free time i you know josh i am i swear is probably one of the busiest men i know but we still all have this free time and whether what are we doing with that time? Mm-hmm. You know, I'm I'm shamed to say that you know some nights, you know, everybody has to have a recharge period. 
Mm-hmm. And I'll be the first one to admit that nothing makes me happier some nights than to turning on Bob's Burgers and laughing for 20 minutes. <laughs> but at a certain point, even during Bob's Burgers, I know that I could use some exercise. I could be standing there with dumbbells or, or on my elliptical machine and still watch that episode of Bob's Burgers. Yep. There are some actions that we can do. There are some there are things that we innately know that we should be doing. So nothing, and I mean absolutely nothing, is going to change until you are brave enough to make a different choice and determined enough to take the needed action. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't agree more with that. I think if if more people just took charge and over the direction of their life and realized it's not happening to them, they're the ones who set things in motion and they have the power to, to change that direction, um, everybody would be much, much happier. So we're going to ask you that please provide us some feedback, whether it's through Twitter or our Facebook page or through our website. Uh, you can find us on either social network under REI Rookies. That's right. And make sure you head over to iTunes, subscribe, rate, and review the podcast. It really helps us find other rookie investors out there. And remember, get off of the bench. And get into the game. We'll see you next time. Go take some action. Testing. No, we're good. You can start. Oh, I didn't realize. Okay.